I want to begin by uh, acknowledging that we are gathered this morning on the homelands of the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nations. And I want to thank Councillor Gary Sam for the blessing. And I want to thank the Lekwungen singers and dancers for drumming us and singing us uh, into the chambers this morning. Um, this blessing by the councillor and the dancing and, and drumming and singing uh, is evidence of the work of reconciliation that we've been doing um, over the past four years and that we'll continue to do over the next four years. Uh, reconciliation is hard work and it's, it's real work and it manifests in uh, welcoming our friends from the Songhees into the chambers this morning because we are always already on their land. I'd also like to thank the outgoing poet laureate Yvonne Blomer. Thank you for taking my challenge and writing a poem for us for today. I appreciate that. And uh, Dean Ansley Tucker, uh, thank you also for uh, very, very um, inspiring words about the importance of hope, faith, and love. Uh, and indeed, in my remarks this morning, uh, some of that will actually be reflected. And so we've all been together informally for the last three days, uh, learning about what it means to, to run a city, what it means to govern. On the first day of orientation, I had some time alone with council, which I requested. And the first time we sat together, I asked the council, councillors, each of them, what do you love about the city of Victoria? And we all love what you all love about the city of Victoria. We love the people who live here and how the people here are dedicated to making the community better. We love the natural environment. We love our great little neighborhood streets, and we want to keep them that way. We love our small town becoming a small city. We love our small businesses. We love that our city is human scale and that it's easy to get around. We love downtown, and we love Chinatown. We love that this is a place where so many people want to call home. And we love the potential. Our job as a council, working alongside all of you here today, and alongside those who have never set foot into City Hall, and everyone in between, is to nurture and steward all of these things that we love at the same time as the city grows and changes. So that was the introduction. Um, my, uh, the remainder of my redress, address will be in three parts. The first part is what we will do. The second part is why we will do what we do. And the third part, and really the most important to me, is how we will do what we do. So there are four key things uh, that we need to do, and we all heard this very loud and clear uh, when we were out knocking on doors and, and um, listening in the community, is tackle affordability in a meaningful way. We are, as we've all heard and we all know, in the midst of an affordability crisis, which means this is an opportunity and indeed a mandate to act. There are three main approaches to affordability, three main approaches to affordability that we'll take. Uh, the first is, uh, housing on all fronts. You will see bold ideas rolling out from this fine group of people uh, behind me, and I'd encourage you to question these ideas to make them better and stronger. Ideas like buying land uh, for housing, larger garden suites, movable tiny homes, an inclusionary housing policy, uh, creative partnerships with other levels of government and other entities, uh, doing more with the land we already have, uh, co-ops, community land trusts, and more. But secondly, affordability is more than just housing. Affordability means things like affordable childcare for workers and families, and that's something you're gonna see us working on. And affordability also means making transportation more affordable. And the thing that I love, and I think that most of council, or probably all of council would agree with, is that transit, walking, and cycling are not only low cost, they are also low carbon. The third approach to affordability is making sure that taxes and fees are affordable so we're not asking our residents and our businesses to live beyond their means. The second big challenge that we have as city, province, country, and indeed as a globe is climate change. 
Probably many of you in this room read the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report when it came out uh, midway through the election campaign. And it was a very stark warning to all of us, and hopefully a motivational document, not just a warning, that we basically have 12 years as a human society to keep the temperature of the planet from not rising more than 1.5 degrees. And this is, as I said, a serious warning and a wake-up call. So what does this have to do with Victoria? Cities around the world have a key role to play in terms of addressing climate change. Cities contribute fully 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. So cities around the world are leading, and Victoria must lead too. In our city, 50% of carbon emissions come from buildings, 40% comes from transportation, and 10% comes from waste. So like affordability, we must act boldly. One of the things I'd encourage all of you to do is to read the city's climate leadership plan. Please read it, and please join us. 1% of emissions in the city come from the city's operations. 99% come from the community. And so in order for us to truly succeed, we need your leadership. One of the things that I would like to roll out in the new year is a climate ambassador program where we, you, select one child, one youth, one adult, and one elder from each neighborhood. And they become the neighborhood climate ambassadors to lead and inspire change on their own streets, schools, and workplaces. And there's a real opportunity globally. We're working with the city of Heidelberg in Germany uh, to potentially um, co-create a conference in Heidelberg in May 2019 on climate neighborhoods. And again, we love our neighborhoods. Our neighborhoods are the structure of this city. And I think if we come together as neighborhoods with this Climate Ambassador Program, we are really poised to lead. And with our human scale, compact city, with people who care profoundly about the climate and climate justice, we know that now is the time to act. Number three challenge and opportunity for us here and all of you is to ensure continual prosperity, continued prosperity rather, inclusion and well-being. We are so lucky in Victoria to have such a strong small business community. It is amazing. And the thing about business in Victoria that I love is business and community are two sides of the same coin. There's nothing that divides us. And so we need to build on our current economic strength, on our current prosperity, at the same time as making sure that there is room in the economy for everyone. And this is why in the past term, and hopefully in this term, the city will continue to play a leadership role in the creation of the Vancouver Island Community Benefit Hub, which really focuses on economic inclusion for marginalized people. It's why the, city, why the city will continue to play a role in the South Island Prosperity Project, which we were a founding member of in 2016. And it's a key reason that the city needs a long-term jobs plan. When we got the five-year report on the official community plan from 2012 to 2017, we saw only a 2% uh, increase in jobs, about 1,100 jobs. Whereas by 2041, we need to create 10,000 new jobs that will be household sustaining jobs. And so that's one of the things that we'll be working on in this term. We've also heard from the business community that transportation and affordable housing are their key issues. So if we take care of the first two that I listed, we're also serving the business community and serving the community. The fourth thing that we need to work on, because we have a mandate from you, uh, is a citizens' assembly. So people in Victoria and Saanich voted yes to exploring the potential, lots of exploring, lots of potential, of the uh, amalgamation of the District of Saanich and the City of Victoria. And that's going to be an interesting process for all of us. The citizens' assembly will be a randomly selected group of citizens who will work independently and come together to make a recommendation to their councils. So very broadly, that is part of the what of what we'll be doing in the next four years. But why? 
Why will we do these things? Interestingly, because this is the very purpose of local government. Our city solicitor, Tom Zaworski, read a section of the community charter to us, as solicitors do, uh, in the, um, the orientation session. And he read section seven, uh, and I'm just gonna quote from one portion of it. The purposes of a municipality include, and there are four, I'm just gonna read one. Fostering the economic, social, and environmental well-being of its community. So our very purpose is to ensure that through everything we do, we're enhancing community well-being. That's our job. And so one of the key commitments this term is not only working to enhance well-being, but also measuring. How are we doing? Is the, are the actions that we're taking actually increasing individual and collective well-being? Now, thankfully, we don't have to invent any um, measuring tools. The economists and others have been putting their minds to this because for a long time, the only way to measure progress was through measuring the economy. If the economy is doing well, everybody must be doing well. Well, we know that that's not true. And so our commitment this term is to measuring well-being and ensuring that we're making investments through the city's budget that are actually going to increase people's well-being and their connections with each other and with this place. So that's the what and that's the how. But most important of all, sorry, that was the what, why, what, what and why, thank you. What and why, most importantly, how. And the how is most important because if we get this wrong, we're going to fail miserably at all of the important work that I already outlined that we need to do. So how are we going to do all of this work? There are four things, four ways. The first is to develop with you and the wider you who are at work or school or not here today, a four-year strategic plan just like we did last time that will clearly outline what you can expect from your council in the next four years. And what we'll do this term, which I think we probably learned from last term, we could have done last term, that's why we have more terms so we can do more things, uh, is to outline very clearly in the plan from its inception what kind of engagement we're going to be doing on which topic and how and when and why. And so council already on Tuesday will be digging into the creation of our four-year strategic plan. We'll roll up our sleeves, we'll work really hard to see if we can get it right. And then in December and January, there's an opportunity for all of you to weigh in, to share with you, us your thoughts and ideas, because it's really important that we get this plan right. So that's the how, and there's an invitation for you to join us. Secondly, Second important how is really cultivating a sense that we are all in this together. That City Hall and the community have the same interests to make life better for all of us in the community. And the we, who is this we, all in this together, it's council, staff, residents, business owners, immigrants, refugees, visitors, all of us. And from our point of view here, what we need to do, and again, this is a lesson learned from last term, we need to look first from the perspective of the community, and then from the perspective of City Hall. And we need to value the expertise of our staff and we have fantastic staff here, and I was reminded of this as they all made their presentations to the new council. We have fantastic staff here with a wealth of expertise. We need to value the expertise of staff alongside the expertise that people have from living on Linden Street or living in Burnside Gorge or running a business on Wharf Street. And when we co-value this expertise, it allows us to co-develop and co-create the city based on shared expertise. The third how, I think probably you'll all agree, this is one of the most important ones, is that we really need to restore civility and decorum to public dialogue. Yes. <laughs> And 
And I don't just mean in election campaigns, I mean always, I mean every day. I mean, when council comes out with what might seem like a wacky idea or one of your neighbors says something that you think, huh, really? That we first always respond with curiosity and generosity. That we give each other, that we give council, that we give new ideas the benefit of the doubt. That we assume the best of intention. And that we show up to a consultation or an engagement session without our minds already made up. And that means all of us as well, not only all of you. Because if we cannot do that as a society, and this is not just Victoria, this is around the world, if we cannot do this as a society, we are not going to be able to solve the biggest problems that we have. Now thankfully, you elected an amazing council. And we are already, and this is the fourth how, we are already working in this way together. I was, I have to admit, surprised and delighted that in three short sessions together, we have come up with a declaration of principles and values about how we're going to work with each other and how we're going to work with you. And even though it hasn't been officially approved, because we haven't been official till just a few minutes ago, uh, Council has given me permission to share this with you this morning. And I'd like to just stress to you that this document was arrived at through dialogue, deliberation, and indeed by consensus. So Victoria City Council 2018 to 2022 Declaration of Principles and Values. In order to create a culture of deep respect, to build the relationships we need to do the work, and to aspire to be our highest selves, even when it feels hard, and when difficult decisions could stand to divide us, we are committed to, one, governing with integrity, transparency, and an unwavering dedication to public service. We are committed to welcoming diversity and fostering, of a spirit, fostering a spirit of inclusion and equity in everything we do. We are committed to leading with creativity and with courage. We're committed to deep listening and critical thinking. We're committed to assuming that everyone is here with good intention to make the community better. We're committed to nurturing a culture of continuous learning with each other, staff, and the public. We're committed to working collaboratively and cooperatively with each other, with staff and the public, while welcoming a diversity of thought and opinion. We are committed to practicing generosity, curiosity, and compassion. We're committed to being patient, kind, and caring. We're committed to bringing a spirit of open-mindedness and open-heartedness to all of our work. We're committed to keeping a sense of lightheartedness and a sense of humor with each other. And, most importantly, we're committed to reviewing these principles once a quarter with the same humility, honesty, and candor with which we govern. So that's our commitment to each other, and that's our commitment to you. And I can't tell you how wonderful it feels to stand in front of a group of people who, in a very short time, has agreed to this way of working together. I'm almost finished, and then we'll get to uh, one formality that we have to do motion-wise, and then an opportunity to gather and, and share some food and, and uh, conversation with each other. So in closing, what do we require from you? We require the benefit of the doubt. We require powerful questions and generous challenges to the ideas we bring forward. But most of all, we require that you continue to be the people of Victoria that we identified at the outset that we love so much. Passionate, committed, sorry, passionate, committed, 
and dedicated to making this place on earth that we all love better together every day. Thank you so much.